So I thought I would do a video on this very important topic. So let's talk about chorioamnionitis, now referred to as intramniotic infection. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at intramniotic infection, previously referred to as chorioamnionitis. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to receive notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So in literal terms, it's simply put, inflammation of the chorion, inflammation of the amnion. But when you talk about intramniotic infection, it's not just limited to the chorion and the amnion, but it's also going to be involving the amniotic fluid, the placenta, or a combination of the four things. So it was previously commonly referred to as chorioamnionitis, but now most literature are going to be referring to it as intramniotic infection. And remember that most of these infections are going to be arising as ascending infections through the genital tract. To give you some perspective, let's talk a little bit about the chorion and the amnion. Remember that these are going to be these two membranes that are going to be surrounding the embryo. They are extra embryonic membranes that are pred predominantly going to be protecting the developing embryo. And they're going to be essential for providing a supportive environment for the fetus as well as carrying out a number of other important functions that I will show you in the subsequent slides. So together they're going to be forming a sac which is what we refer to as the amniotic sac and this amniotic sac is going to have fluid on the inside which is known as amniotic fluid which has various functions in pregnancy and pretty much is essential for the normal fetal development. So if we turn our attention to this image here as we can see the inner membrane there is known as the amnion which produces this fluid that is in the inside, which is known as the amniotic fluid. The child is swimming in this amniotic fluid. Then the outer membrane that is surrounding this is known as the chorion. So this outer membrane is known as the chorion. And these two together are going to form what is known as the amniotic sac. So if you have inflammation or infection that's affecting the placenta, it's affecting the chorion, it's affecting the amnion, or it's even affecting the amniotic fluid, we refer to that as intramniotic infection or previously referred to as chorioamnionitis. So remember that the chorion is the outermost extra embryonic membrane. It's going to be quite thick, it's vascular, and it's going to be consisting of connective tissue. It's going to be lining the uterine wall. So predominantly this is going to function in anchoring the embryo to the uterus and also for exchange of gases and nutrients between the mother and the fetus. Remember that it's also going to be producing a certain uh, hormones and one important hormone in pregnancy is the human chorionic gonadotrophin which we can use in the diagnosis of pregnancy. We can also use to monitor conditions like molar pregnancies. Then the amnion is the inner membrane which is rather thin and transparent and this one is going to be responsible for the production of this amniotic fluid which is found on the inside and this actually provides a cushion for the fetus. It also allows the fetus to freely move. It also aids in the development of the limbs, the development of the lungs of the fetus and remember that this amnion is going to be producing a number of proteins that are important in preventing infections and also regulating the growth uh, and development of the fetus. So as long as these membranes are intact. It means that any ascending infection will most likely be repelled and won't really affect the fetus. But once these membranes are ruptured, that defense is gone and it's easy for these infections to colonize the contents that are found inside these uh, sacs. So the key function and um, key functions of the chorion and amnion are going to be including things like protection. Remember that these are going to be protecting the fetus from mechanical injury, from infection, from dehydration. There's also going to be a gaseous and nutrient exchange that are going to facilitate the exchange of gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide as well as nutrients between the mother and the fetus. It's also responsible for hormone production, for example, beta HCG like I told you about. Um, that's the human chorionic gonadotrophin. Then also for amniotic fluid production, remember that the amnion is on that's going to be producing the amniotic fluid, which acts as a cushion 
for the fetus it also allows the fetus to freely move it also aids in lung development it also has some antibacterial properties it's also responsible for the regulation of the fetal growth and development remember the amnion is going to be producing a number of these proteins that are quite important for regulating growth and development of the fetus so coming back to in our intramniotic infection so anything that's going to be predisposing infections to ascending or once these membranes are broken can predispose this individual to develop intramniotic uh, infection or intracoriamnionitis. Uh, so it could be a prolonged rupture of membranes that is lasting more than or equal to 18 to 24 hours between the rupture, the time of rupture and the delivery. If the time is longer than this, then you are at a higher risk of developing a choriamnionitis or intramniotic infection. Then you may have premature rupture of membranes, that's PROM, you may have preterm labor. Preterm labor can be caused by choriamnionitis. Choriamnionitis can also cause preterm labor. Then you may have a meconium stained amniotic fluid you may have presence of genital tract pathologies who are really worried about the group B streptococci. You may have multiple digital examinations. That's vaginal examinations of a woman that's in labor, especially when the membranes have ruptured. You have prolonged labor and you may also have internal fetal or uterine monitoring. All these are going to be risk factors to predispose an individual to intramniotic infections. Now, how is a present going to present? Typically, it's an infection. So there's going to be features of inflammation, the, the Tumor, rubo, cola, dolo, functiolesa, those Latin words. So now there's going to be a fever. I will talk about how high you have to actually, the temperature has to be for you to have the suspicion or for you to actually confirm a diagnosis. Then you may have other features such as maternal tachycardia. You may have fetal tachycardia. You may have uterine tenderness. There may be a foul smelling amniotic fluid or even sometimes a purulent cervical discharge. Remember that the infection may not sometimes cause these typical symptoms. You may get what is known as a subclinical infection which may not have these characteristic symptoms. So how do we make a diagnosis? So remember that the intramniotic infection is going to be either suspected or diagnosed based on certain clinical or sometimes even laboratory findings. So you may sometimes have a mother having an isolated a rise in the temperature, what we call an isolated maternal fever. For example, if you get the oral temperature and a single reading that's greater than 39 degrees, or you get an oral temperature that's between 38 to 39, and these two readings are measured after 30 minutes, then this mother has what is known as isolated maternal fever. It doesn't necessarily mean that she may have the choriamnionitis or intramniotic infection, and it doesn't automatically mean that you must treat the infection. So this is just maybe an isolated maternal fever then you may sometimes suspect intramniotic infection you have suspicion so it may be based when the mother has this persistent maternal fever and they have a clinical criteria that's meeting the following things they may have an elevation in the maternal white cell count on your hemogram they may have fetal tachycardia they may have a purulent cervical discharge remember that maternal fever in the presence of uterine tenderness in the presence of confirmed premature rupture of membranes in the absence of any upper respiratory tract or any urinary tract infection is most likely indicative of choriamnionitis. And it's often confirmed if there is suspicion of infection and then you confirm it by doing certain tests where you do the test on the amniotic fluid, you can perform a gram stain, you can do a culture, you can check the glucose level, I'll give you the readings of these things uh, a bit later on. Then you may sometimes do histological examination of the placenta to that may show features of inflammation, it may show features of infection. Remember that, like I said, having a single symptom or a single sign which may be caused by other things is less reliable. For example, if you just have fetal tachycardia as the only thing, it may be due to maybe the mother using certain drugs. It may be due to just the fetus itself having an arrhythmia. However, if you have this intramniotic infection that is absent, then the heart rate is going to be returning to baseline and as these other conditions actually resolve. If the mother takes stops taking the drug, the heart rate of the fetus should return back to the baseline. Remember that we often confirm our intramniotic amniotic infection after delivery through the correlation with the placenta pathology, features of infection and inflammation of the placenta. Then remember for the subclinical infections, there may be this refractory preterm labor. Where someone gets into preterm labor, you attempt to give them some tocolytics and despite you giving them tocolytics, they still go into labor or they still have features of labor. So if the membranes actually have ruptured prematurely, 
before term, then clinicians must have that index of suspicion that this could be a subclinical infection and they should determine whether they should induce this labor or not because the longer the child stays in that area where it's uh, infected, the higher the risk of other complications which we'll mention. You may do an amniocentesis with a couch of the amniotic fluid that can help you make a diagnosis of the subclinical infection. Now the following features are going to be suggestive when you actually analyze the fluid. You may get the presence of bacteria in that fluid. You may get leukocytes using a gram stain. You may sometimes get positive culture. You grow an organism from there. You may sometimes get glucose levels less than 15 milligrams per deciliter, or the white cell count is greater than 30 cells per microliter. Then treatment is often recommended when you get the following things. For example, when you have an intramniotic infection that is either suspected or confirmed. If you have a woman that's in labor and has an isolated temperature greater than 39 degrees Celsius and no other clinical risk factors for fever, you may want to treat this woman. And remember that if a woman that has a temperature between 38 to 39 and there are no risk factors for fever, then treatment sometimes can be considered. Sometimes you may actually not even give this woman treatment. And remember the treatment for this is going to be by giving these women broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics. Then you also aim to deliver these women. So there are different regimens that you can actually use. One common regimen that is used is going to be combining ampicillin, which you can give at 2 grams IV every 6 hours. So you're going to be giving it 4 times a day, combined with gentamicin. You can either give it as gentamicin 5 milligrams per kg every day day once a day or you can give it as the two milligrams per kg as a loading dose then you give 1.5 milligrams per kg every eight hours so every th every three times a day then the second regimen is for those that you aim to deliver via cesarean section and they haven't delivered vaginally after you clamp the cord you can give these same two drugs you give the ampicillin and the gentamicin in addition to that you give them a dose also of either clindamycin 900 milligrams iv or metronidazole 500 milligrams iv then for those that have mild penicillin allergy and they can't really take the ampicillin you may substitute and actually give kefazolin or cefazolin and this is going to be combined with gentamicin then for those that have a severe penicillin allergy you want to use clindamycin or metronidazole plus gentamicin or you may use vancomycin plus gentamicin remember vancomycin should be used in women who have been colonized with group b streptococcus and gbs that is resistant to clindamycin or erythromycin uh, unless if clindamycin inducible resistance testing is negative then you can use vancomycin and remember that you can also use this if the antibiotic sensitivities are not so available then remember that the duration of these antibiotics are going to be varying depending on individual circumstances so for example how high the fever was when the fever last spiked in relation to delivery and sometimes the antibiotics should not automatically be continued after delivery you you should use them based on the clinical findings. For example, bacteremia, a prolonged fever, and no risk factors are, are for postpartum endometritis, regardless of the delivery route. And remember, women who have a vaginal delivery are less likely to develop endometritis and may not require postpartum antibiotics. After cesarean section, though, at least one additional dose of antibiotics is recommended. You may also want to give some antipyretics, uh, preferably acetaminophen before delivery uh, should be given in addition to antibiotics. And remember that anti-amniotic infection alone is rarely an indication for cesarean delivery, contrary to the most popular belief. And you should actually also inform the neonatal care team when intramniotic infection is suspected or if it's confirmed and what risk factors are present. And this is actually essential for optimizing evaluation and treatment of the neonate. To prevent the intramniotic infection, you want to avoid or minimize digital rectal, uh, or rather digital pelvic examination in women with preterm uh, premature rupture of membranes. You want to cover them on broad spectrum antibiotics for any woman that's in preterm premature rupture of membranes because you want to uh, prolong the latency. Remember, latency is the period where the membranes rupture to when they actually begin to get into labor or they start into labor. So remember, you want to prolong this period to cover them on antibiotics until they deliver. And this decreases the risk of infant morbidity and mortality. 
complications may be divided as maternal and fetal. Maternal complications may be things like bacteremia, increased risk of cesarean delivery, uterine atony, which can lead to postpartum hemorrhage, pelvic abscess, thromboembolism, you may have wound complications, you may have placenta abruption, you may have septic shock, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and sometimes these things are actually not so common if you cover those patients on antibiotics. Then you may have fetal complications like premature uh, delivery or preterm delivery. Remember that, like I said, intramniotic infection can cause uh, this preterm delivery and also preterm delivery can cause uh, intraamniotic um, infection. Then this infection actually is going to be accounting for 50% of the deliveries before 30 weeks and it occurs in about 33% of the women who have preterm labor with an intact membrane and 40% of women who are uh, prom and are uh, having contractions when admitted, then also 75% of them who go into labor after admission for prom. It may cause children to be born with an APGA score less than three. There may be neonatal infections that may present as sepsis, pneumonia, or even sometimes meningitis. Child may have seizures. In the long run, they may develop cerebral palsy. And if you're one of those individuals that, that believes that death is a complication, then you may add death to that complication list. I really hope you enjoyed this lecture on intramniotic infection. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.